afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Joan Mulvihill. I am your host again for another exciting IVI webinar. Um, one of many in the series with loads more to tell you about that are coming up in the new year, but we'll do that at the very end. That's your teaser to stay on the call for the duration. And um, today we are going to be talking about the changing role of customer experience design and analytics in today's retail. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers for you. Um, our first is Paul Sweeney, co-founder and head of product at Webio and co-founder of ConverCon. Now, just to know, you're wearing the company of greatness today because I have just been reliably informed that, um, that the guys have just won best use of responsible AI and ethics at the recent AI awards for Ireland. So um, we'll be learning literally from the master himself. And we are joined then by Eleonora Pantano, Senior Lecturer, Associate Professor of Marketing at the University of Bristol. And um, great to have someone from the UK here where I started my career in retail as it happens. So delighted to have you here, Eleonora, today. We will then be moving on to hear from Douglas Serquera, Data Scientist at the Global Strategic Pricing Team at RHI um, Magnesita. And then last but not least, um, our very own digital retail cluster update from Rehan. Iftikhar, I, sorry, I always struggle with that, Rehan, but I'm doing my best. Uh, Rehan Iftikhar is a researcher at IVI Maynooth University and the people who are brought us today. So delighted to have you here as well. Now, when the guys have all done their presentation, we are going to go into a lovely half hour discussion and panel chat. Um, I'll be making notes and coming up with questions throughout the sessions, but by all means, you can ask some questions yourself by popping them into the Q&A, not the chat now, pop them into the Q&A, and uh, I'll be able to get through those when we go to the Q&A session at the end. Um, but without further ado, delighted to welcome our first speaker. Paul, the slides are all yours. I think you're going to share yourself and um, we'll leave you to it. Thank you. Super. Let me just do a screen share here now. That should be sharing now and we should just be playing from the start. So thank you everyone uh, for coming and paying some attention to me. Um, I'm uh, Paul Sweeney. I am the uh, product lead at, and co-founder at Webio and co-founder of ConverCon. And so today I'm going to be talking about conversational AI in retail with the focus on customer service. So uh, just uh, the, the way that we think about uh, conversational AI is harnessing the power of AI to predict and guide customer conversations. So first you're trying to guide the customer through a series of goals, and then you're trying to predict whether or not those goals will be achieved or not. There are other great definitions out there. Uh, this one from Deloitte, a, prog uh, a programmatic and intelligent way of offering a conversational experience to mimic conversations with real people through digital and telecommunications technologies. And that's actually doing quite a lot of work in here because conversational technology is actually programmatic. You have to step through it in phases. It's very like engineering when you get into the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but ultimately what you're trying to do is deliver a conversational experience. And with people, we feel things and how we feel about a conversation is going to reflect the, the, uh, the entire interaction with a company. And if you frankly fluff experiences, people remember that. And so we need to be able to parse conversations in a really intelligent way and get responses to people that make sense. So I'd just like to start out by saying that um, people uh, the, looking at AI and the use of AI um, point to um, NLP, uh, natural language processing, and conversational AI is a part of that. And one of the big areas that it's used in is customer service. Um, so we can again go 80, 20, 80% 80 of the implications in customer facing situations tends to be customer service. And it also tends to try and do things that we were already kind of familiar with as tasks. So try and onboard customers, route customers to people that can answer their questions, get conversational um, data from people like surveys. Um, so again, it, it's a lot of the work that we're familiar with. It's just being approached in a different way. And we're trying to do these things uh, again for reasons that are very 
uh, common to us. We understand these reasons. People like to be able to buy at all times of the day. They like to be able to get service at all times of the day. Um, they like to be able to change their services, adopt them, be flexible. Companies also like the cost savings they can get from automating. And more and more with COVID and post-COVID, uh, retailers are having a lot of challenges getting people and retaining people in all parts of their business, but particularly in the customer service and contact center area. So anything that can help with employee productivity or to help people feel more um, valued at work or more empowered at work is going to get a bit of traction. So again, it would be familiar to us what we say and how we say it is very impactful. Um, in text conversations, we're back and forth. We're very uh, informal at times. We speak in different ways. We communicate in text language or we say things a bit differently. But the advantage of text conversations is they're already written out. They're very available to be, um, to be analyzed. And of course, preference-wise, more and more millennials and people uh, younger than 40, even younger than 30, younger than 20, all the way down, they prefer text and messaging interaction as a platform. As you get older, people prefer voice interaction. So people over 50, 60, 70, that, that direction, more of a gravitation towards voice services. Um, and voice is a very, very difficult thing to, um, to really do well with conversational AI. But how we say things, we're telling people a lot more than, we, than are just our words, the pacing, the pauses, these all tell us, they're all tells in a conversation about how we're feeling. Like if you ask someone, do you want to, are you doing anything on Saturday night? Would you like to go out? And they pause and say, ah, oh, that's interesting. They're not going out. The pause tells you everything. And so actually you can strip words out of a lot of conversations and just look at the acoustics of the conversation and it will tell you more or less the sentiment and how that person's feeling about um, what's going on in that conversation. And so we have text, we have voice, but we also have visual input. And visual input is where we, um, for instance, at Webio, we have customers in Italy that will upload documents, upload like a driver's license photo, a photo of a passport or something like that as proof of who they are. Um, and so you have text, you have messaging, you have visual inputs. But that's going to get really, really more sophisticated as this new concept of unreal humans comes down uh, down the stream. And that that is people that look and act exactly like humans. You're talking away to them. They look like a human. They, they speak like a human. So that's going to become much more of a thing. And just with regards how this all gets kind of complicated is when you're working with um, systems and you want to ask it for something. Asking for something verbally is very fast. It's like three times faster than writing it in. But we always don't want the, the response to be in voice. So we might ask for it in voice and say like, um, what kind of vintage sneakers do you sell in size 10? And they'll just bring up a visual of the five or six pairs of sneakers and then you can ask more questions about it. But the response is visual as opposed to being in a voice. So again, just to talk about the general area of conversational AI, it's text, it's voice, it's visual. It can be in each channel. It can be across channels. It will get kind of complicated, but the general rule is start easy and then layer in different levels of complexity as you go. So for, for Webio, we're in what we call a very, or even the most difficult customer service environment. So our customers are effectively providing customer service in the credit and collections department. So their job is to um, ultimately get paid, help the company get paid, but also it has to treat customers in a very respectful way. And overall, they don't want to lose customers. They want customers coming back. And they also have increasing levels of oversight from official bodies. So they have to be very regulatory compliant. So an example of conversational AI difficulties in this environment. Can I move the next payment to the last Friday of the month? Now, to be able to answer this, you have to know what the payment is, what the next payment date is, and can they move it to the last Friday of the month, which is what, what date is that? So there's an awful lot of information to be gathered out of this one line. I'd love to pay, but I don't think I can. 
starts out feeling like, oh, this is very good. This is very positive. But the second part of the sentence might negate the first part of the sentence. So again, conversations can be quite complex, even at a simple level. I'm off on my holiday now and money is tight. So in this sentence, in our context of doing a credit collections conversation, we're saying um, they're not going on their summer holidays. They were on a payment holiday. And when we say money is tight, they mean I don't have a lot of disposable income right now. Things are very, uh, I don't have a lot of disposable income. So money's tight means a thing. Holiday means a different thing than you might expect. My partner lost their job two weeks ago, and we're finding it very difficult at the moment. So the partner in this context probably means the, the, uh, uh, the uh, husband, wife, partner uh, in the domestic context. And finding things very difficult at the moment, again, is similar to money is tight. So language, even at the very simplest level, is telling us uh, many things at once and often sometimes conflicting things. So we have to do this thing called disambiguation. So designing these kind of conversations, as you can imagine, is a challenge. Um, and so disambiguation, to do that, it means you have to um, make a, a, an ambiguous situation clearer. And the way you do that is you try and understand the intent of a conversation. So what are you trying to achieve here? Are you trying to return a product? Are you trying to change a size? Are you trying to get a, a, a delivery changed? And so once you have some level of uh, intent recognition, what you can do is use a reply process to further clarify. So um, if you wanted to change from, say, a delivery from 11 o'clock tomorrow at your own home to 12 o'clock at your father's house, you'd have to be able to follow on and go, I, I really need to change the delivery tomorrow. The response would be, OK, where do you want to change to? Where do you want it delivered? So you have a time and a place. Um, and they're the two pieces of information that you're looking for and you need to get in the reply. And so the way you, you, you get that kind of clarification is you restrict the context through prompt framing. So if you um, are in a web chat, for instance, and it allows you to say anything, well, then you can type in anything. But if you have the framing as, hey, I'm Paul, your uh, intelligent assistant, I can help you with your delivery questions, your returns, and anything to do with changing sizes. That means you're telling the person, these are the things I can help you with as an intelligent assistant. Don't ask me about our new sneakers on the market or are you guys opening a new shop in China? And another thing about designing good conversations is when you are asking for a question and maybe the customer doesn't understand what you said or doesn't understand uh, the, the response you've given them, it's called fallback handling. So when things don't go right first time, how do you handle the fallbacks? So an example of that is if I said to you, um, uh, what time would you like that delivered tomorrow? And you say three o'clock and it goes, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. And you go two o'clock. Sorry, I didn't understand that. The second, I didn't understand that, is very annoying to the end user because it's obvious that I'm now in a kind of just a not a happy path. So just even changing the way you frame the next follow-on attempt to get a response is, um, is a design issue. And how you generate these prompts can be, you can write them out ahead of time or you can... Um, you can get AI to help you generate some of these prompts. And more and more of that is actually going to be generated by AI. And a prompt, prompt summary is a really good idea in design where I might be asking you several things to do with, just to take the continue the example of a delivery, I might be getting the time and the place and do you prefer it delivered to the front, front, um, front door and gathering those kind of details. So the last step in your interaction is saying, so, You'd like it delivered at three o'clock tomorrow to your current address, which is this, and uh, it'll be Paul Sweeney accepting the package. And I go, yes. And so the prompt, the summary at the end of it has given me all the details I need at the end of that process. And this is an example as well of where this concept of short-term, long-term memory is um, important in conversational design. 
So you want something that does, um, if I give you my size at the beginning of a conversation, and at the end, I'm doing this, this checkout again, um, and I might say, oh, actually, I'm not size 11, I'm size 10. You don't want to go through building that whole conversation again to figure out what color, what time, what, what you know, all the other details of that, that sneaker you were buying. So a conversational design and a conversation technology has to be able to hold important pieces of that conversation context and then know that you um, are going to use that at the, the last stage. So best idea is to preload conversations with the data that you have at all times. If don't ask for things a second time. Now, I'm just going to flick very quickly at the end here just to go, look, natural language processing, it's about understanding intents, extracting entities. It's about getting the right data into a conversation. It's about understanding and keeping context throughout a conversation. It's about using machine learning in terms of getting better and getting more predictive. It's understanding, hey, what kind of things do we want to be able to predict in a conversation? And then what other kind of propensities might we want to build to help us do our job better? And ultimately, conversational is all about automating at scale to reduce costs and increase service levels, but also creating amazing customer service experiences because that's how you make people feel at the end of the process. I hope that's enough uh, to get you all into the idea of what conversational technology might be and how it might be something interesting in the retail arena. Thanks, folks. That was, that was great, Paul. Thank you so much. What a great way to get us started. I have to say, I smile to myself when I'm set, when I read, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. That is right up there with, there is an unexpected item in the bagging area. There is no more <laughs> annoying, predictive noise than there is an unexpected item in the bagging area than, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that, on a loop going. Yeah. 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 So, um, yes, and no one wants to have a conversation with me when I get like that. Um, <laughs> So listen, that's great and a really, really great start in terms of that customer experience and how we can use these kind of technologies in designing our retail experiences. Um, and that brings me on to our next speaker. So Paul, you're now off the hook for a little while till we come to the Q&A, um, but bear with us. Eleonora, I'm going to pass over to you. So as I said, a senior lecturer at the Mar of Marketing at the University of Bristol, creating value with customers, analytics. Eleonora. Hello, hello everyone. I'm uh, uh, Dr. Eleonora Pantano from the University of Bristol. And uh, okay, this is just an overview of who I am. Uh, my background is more on uh, technology and I applied to marketing with emphasis on retailing and consumer behavior. So following exactly what said um, from our uh, previous, by our uh, previous speaker, I will show some example of how this data can be used in, uh, um, in the UK and in general by uh, retailers. So I will talk about uh, uh, more in details about uh, this data, the text, uh, images, uh, etc. And then uh, the different kind of uh, analysis with uh, uh, examples from my um, studies in particular, I will focus on uh, text and images, uh, but I'm working also on uh, gesture and uh, audio, which is a bit more complex. But for now, I focus on these uh, and I will show you some uh, um, results. Um, so, um, in addition to what just said, we know that any time that a customer interacts with a new technology generates some data which are unstructured uh, because these, inf these uh, data are not uh, in a uh, specific uh, um, established form. Uh, they are not numbers. So we need a particular metrics to really get value uh, from these. However, due to the uh, huge uh, usage of technologies, which is not only um, robots, but we can uh, uh, include also the online interactions um, and social media and uh, um, browsing a website uh, or in the uh, in-person uh, context, uh, um, in-store uh, interactive displays uh, or uh, um, apps, 
and so on. So all these uh, uh, interaction generates data and uh, um, actually more than 80% of the data that uh, uh, companies uh, um, have are unstructured. So there is a huge space uh, for exploitment uh, to better understand the consumers and predict uh, uh, trends. And uh, this kind of data is uh, growing uh, 15 times faster. These data are taken from uh, um, McKinsey uh, reports, but uh, uh, these numbers uh, increase uh, every year. And uh, uh, of course, extracting data from, uh, um, extracting knowledge from this kind of data is a uh, more complex, more complex and expensive. Um, for this reason, we need to employ new metrics based on a machine learning algorithm um, because these data are uh, not uh, numbers, are not uh, numeric. So this is uh, more or less um, an example how we move towards, uh, oh, sorry, um, I went too fast, um, from uh, traditional data numeric data to uh, actual ones like uh, video data. So um, we have uh, all the conversation that consumers uh, uh, do online in terms of text, but also uh, with uh, um, robots or virtual shopping assistants. And uh, uh, the highly unstructured data are the video, but this video can be video posted by consumers or they can be video taken from uh, the CCTV uh, camera available in the stores, in the high streets, uh, um, etc., which are actually used in an airport for security control, for safety and security, but they can still be used uh, uh, in retailing. Still, there is a... Um, open uh, space for research, understand how to exploit uh, um, these. And uh, uh, this can be used uh, in advertising and promotion, for instance, uh, through the usage of uh, eye tracking technologies, uh, which actually follow uh, consumers' eye towards uh, products, uh, billboards, uh, uh, images, and so on, or uh, to uh, better manage uh, the uh, retail channels. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so on. But uh, this is uh, um, first of a uh, uh, couple of examples of this data. This is based uh, on uh, text analytics. And uh, um, in this case, I used all uh, um, users' uh, uh, tweets. So we can call it as a spontaneous communication on social media about uh, uh, three. Uh, fast fashion retailers uh, based in UK, but uh, um, available almost uh, anywhere. And the first kind of analysis was a sentiment analytics. In other words, we wanted to, to understand how much consumers were positive, were posting something positive or negative towards a certain brand. So we actually use it as a... Um, hashtag the name of this uh, uh, specific uh, uh, fast fashion brand and uh, you see you can uh, compare the volume of the data uh, that you can extract and then uh, the amount of uh, positive or negative so you can understand what people uh, say, what uh, um, consumers say about your brand but you can also compare with others since these are uh, almost open, the, open data. And this was just the first of a series of uh, uh, analyses, but uh, this already gives some uh, information about uh, um, what consumer says. And as you can see, company B, I cannot reveal the identity uh, for privacy uh, purposes, but you see uh, there is a huge a larger um, discussion about, about, mm, around uh, company B if compared to other. Of course, as I previously uh, said, there are still some limits in this kind of research because uh, the actual uh, uh, algorithms are not able to detect, uh, for instance, uh, sarcasm, and they can assign these uh, 
positive or negative or uh, neutral labels only if uh, some words labeled as a positive or negative are included in uh, um, those uh, uh, text and also neutral um, since uh, the algorithm are not uh, able yet the majority of algorithm to uh, detect for instance uh, emoji because sometimes it is possible that the tweets only contain a picture and the hashtag or just uh, um, an emoticon so still this uh, uh, analysis was based only on text so um, full uh, words this is why we still see a huge number of uh, neutral and neutral means that uh, um, the algorithm was not able to assign uh, the algorithm was not able to assign the label um, positive or negative. A second example is uh, on uh, uh, topics extraction. In this case, we want to understand uh, um, why the motivations of consumers to engage with uh, um, renting uh, services for uh, luxury uh, products. So we are talking about uh, uh, luxury fashions, uh, including clothes and accessories. Um, so we extracted, uh, in this case, the topics. So uh, a more complex algorithm than the, the one that I just uh, showed to you is uh, uh, able to extract topics uh, um, I, I don't explain you in detail, but based on the association of words included uh, in the text, it automatically detects um, the main uh, um, topics or the main, the most recurrent uh, uh, theme. And uh, um, so it is based on a group of words with a meaning. And uh, um, we see that uh, here, based on a frequency analysis, and of course, there is a EF, uh, um, uh, IDF, because there is also these elements that uh, consider that some words are uh, uh, less common than others, but still um, have a certain value. So we extracted why consumers uh, um, accessed these, just uh, um, extracting the tweets containing uh, this uh, uh, particular company as exemplar company in US, uh, the, most, the most diffused in US, allowing to rent uh, luxury clothes. And uh, this was uh, conducted before uh, uh, COVID, um, since we know that uh, during the COVID, uh, this kind of consumption uh, um, changed. Uh, and uh, um, also the occasion for wearing this kind of clothes uh, um, changed uh, uh, during, COVID, uh, during COVID. So we extracted uh, the various needs for consumers. Uh, so, okay, the first motivation was to wear uh, um, a certain uh, uh, elegant clothes for uh, a special uh, occasion which didn't require to actually buy uh, and uh, um, of course uh, this was the first motivation but then we also noticed that, that there was also the intention to uh, rent uh, luxury clothes uh, for uh, um, for in for increasing the life cycle of a, of a product uh, which means that an, since I will wear only once, I can use, uh, uh, I can uh, uh, borrow from others and uh, give others what I uh, use it only once. So there is uh, uh, also this motivation, even if it was uh, the latest, uh, at least from what people uh, uh, shared online. Uh, concerning the images, uh, in this case, uh, this is an example from uh, uh, five uh, luxury hotels in London, and uh, we use the data collected from uh, TripAdvisor. Um, if you are familiar with this uh, platform, you know that uh, uh, anyone can leave uh, um, a review of uh, any, uh, almost any place and uh, include uh, a picture. 
So what we did was collecting the pictures that uh, uh, people uploaded and also this uh, uh, collection uh, has been made uh, uh, before COVID. And we noticed that uh, for a six uh, uh, hotel in London, luxury hotel, we noticed what uh, um, people uh, uh, put a score of the uh, picture. So we used a particular algorithm with uh, um, a certain, uh, um, let's say, vocabulary included. So um, this uh, algorithm was uh, trained in order to detect object and associate uh, a name, actually uh, a label to each uh, object. And uh, you see, uh, these are the, um, the objects and then we made a sort of a frequency analysis of this object in the pictures considering only one the object the core in the picture and we uh, made the comparison oh i went too fast and uh, we noticed uh, uh, that for instance even if uh, in the website of this uh, hotel uh, they claimed the spectacular view the uh, Ashtoning scenarios, no one really took a picture um, from the window, which means that probably consumers or travelers are more interested in other elements of the room than on, uh, uh, on the scenario. And uh, um, hotel managers could uh, try to match uh, what is important for consumers and what they really promote as a um, benefit uh, from their hotel. For instance, we largely see pictures of uh, um, the bath, but uh, not, not all these websites really provide the pictures of the bath. But uh, if this is one of the most photographed uh, thing in the uh, hotel, it means that it, it has value. Uh, for travelers and uh, should be considered when uh, promoting uh, the hotel. Uh, another example, uh, this is uh, um, still based on object frequency. Um, and in this case about uh, uh, image, uh, the question was if a store building can be a tourism attraction and uh, in this case, we considered, again, London, and we considered the Harrods. And we asked if Harrods can be considered a, a tourism destination uh, in, uh, in London. Also, in this case, we collected the pictures uh, um, from online, in this case, uh, from Instagram. And, uh, uh, you know, the each picture has a, a geotag. So then we placed the picture uh, in the map. We considered uh, uh, the radius of uh, one kilometer from uh, um, the main entrance uh, of Harrods. Uh, we placed, uh, so you see these points are actually the pictures. Also, this data collection uh, was made uh, before COVID. And then we made a sort of cluster analysis through a particular algorithm. And we noticed that, uh, um, yes, uh, uh, Harrods, despite that there are uh, despite other possible uh, attractions in the area, Harrods was the one with the highest number of pictures. So yes, it, it is uh, a tourism uh, destination. And uh, um, then uh, still, uh, uh, so uh, concerning Harrods, uh, uh, we still focused on a sort of uh, object frequency. Sorry, Eleonora, I'm just yeah. going to ask you, can you just keep an eye on time? You're just over at the moment. I'm not sure many more Oh, yes, uh, but this is uh, the last example. Oh, perfect. Okay, just checking in. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so this is the last example uh, still on images. We can check the sentiment, uh, the actual emotion showed on the uh, picture. We did this on pictures posted online. So there is a bias because people tend to post the pictures when it's he, she appears better or smiling, but still we collected all the pictures um, related to the main uh, shopping centers in the UK, and we analyzed the, the um, emotions appearing uh, in this uh, picture through um, an algorithm 
uh, based on uh, um, image uh, identification, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, as you can see, it is just identify the position of some points in the face. So no information about race, gender, or age, just the position of the points, which gives uh, um, the idea uh, of the emotion based on uh, uh, psychologist uh, um, research. And uh, this was my final uh, example. Sorry for being a bit over. And thank you very much for your uh, attention. Eleanor, that was super fascinating. Sorry I put you under time pressure at the end. It's just, um, we, we only have an hour and a half today. So uh, I just wanna make sure we get a chance for everybody. But that was really, really interesting. And I think particularly that facial recognition in terms of different emotions as people are going through various uh, various locations. So uh, just so much insight there. Um, thank you so much for that. And we are, gosh, we are already powering through. So Douglas, our next speaker, data scientist at the Global Strategic Pricing Team at RHI Magnesita. Douglas, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Perfect. Great. Just um, so, uh, hello everyone. Thanks again for inviting me to this. I hope to keep the very high level that I have seen so far. Um, basically, I would like to talk to you today about a use case I've been working with my team in my company, um, and it's going to be regarding the possibility of applying explainable AI for dynamic pricing processes. Um, but in order to give you the the idea or why we actually talk about the name pricing this scenario, it's important to mention what's the product of uh, the company we uh, I'm working on. So uh, we basically sell and produce refractories. And when you think of refractories, you actually you don't see them, but they are everywhere because uh, they are basically used for producing all these types of materials that you see here. So concrete, copper, steel, glass, and aluminum. Um, and it's basically a material which is resistant to heat, um, which enables the production of such materials. So in the end, we also deal with many customers, which are companies, but they also have their particularities. They change their behavior, similarly to what we also can see uh, in retailing itself. So, um, it's talking specifically now about uh, particular challenges which are driving us or which are, you know, steering a vision towards being more dynamic in terms of pricing. Um, one of the first challenges for us and motivation to, to try that would be the size of the company, actually, the first one, because when you think of a, a, a global company, you have, of course, different realities regions with particular pricing strategies. Um, so in the end, even if you are in a, in a global department, you need to align your strategy to those realities, right? So these, um, these elements is very important when you are providing pricing for different teams uh, around the world. And another uh, quite big challenge on this regard is the portfolio. So since uh, the company is, is the leader in the refractory industry, of course, it also has uh, the largest range of products or, or refractory products to sell and to offer to customers. So in the end, the challenge would be exactly how you can manage pricing for such a large portfolio, but at the same time that you give a proper and um, clear and explainable guidance to, to the experts, to the users of such systems which are recommending prices for these different products because it, it definitely, it won't be possible to manage manually or via Excel, for, for example, prices for all, for hundreds of products. Um, the, but we also have a third challenge, which I, I think you all can probably relate, which is the vol volatility of the market. So now we face, we have, we have faced, of course, no one forgets uh, the pandemic, but we also have, still have somehow some energy crisis and of course collisions or unfortunately some conflicts, which also impact the reality, supply chain and all those factors, phenomena, which can impact the demand, but also 
um, production costs of your particular goods for selling to customers, right? So in the end, uh, you have different aspects which can get together and will um, influence uh, either your internal production costs or also the how your customers perceive your products or how they perceive the needs for uh, for having your products, right? So you need to know how to price uh, your uh, uh, goods in such uh, disruptive scenarios as well. And in order to do this, you actually need to look into um, an internal and an external perspective. So you need to, to understand what the market, what, what's the pressure of the market to yourself, to your market share, but you also need to understand your internal perspective. What's, what's the power that you have at the moment in order to uh, um, give good prices according to this challenging environment? So in the end, the question for this challenge would be exactly how you can actually do pricing and do fair pricing for your customers, which can keep your profitability given such uh, volatility and the increasing change in behavior of the cosmos. Um, and in order to uh, maybe what we have been doing to, uh, and tr to, in order to tackle or try to tackle these challenges is uh, establishing a explainable AI a strategy for dynamic pricing processes. So uh, just to give you an idea of what I mean when I talk about an explainable AI system for dynamic pricing, what you would have actually in this um, big picture is basically, first of all, some particular factors, uh, which you give us inputs to an AI model. These factors can be related to market indicators, you know, like inflation, uh, demand for from a particular industry or customer, GDP from a particular country or region. It can also be cost drivers, what would be, um, the cost for, uh, you know, of energy, for example, or of raw materials, which I need to use for my production. And of course, customer behavior, customer segment. So what is this customer doing with my products? Where is this customer located? Uh, what's the current reality of this customer? Is it an urgent demand or, or something which can wait a bit more? So as you see, as you can imagine, it's it's a set of very complex factors which need to get together. But still, even if it uh, doesn't matter how advanced your model can be, what's important is not always only the prediction or which price it's given, but also why it's giving this price. Because uh, when you give such a, uh, an outcome to a pricing expert, he needs to use this output for communicating, for providing guidance to other departments with a company. So you have many different stakeholders which depend on such guidance, pricing guidance. Of course, uh, customers uh, are one of them because you need to, you want to be fair to, to, to your customers, but you also want to keep your competitiveness, right? So that's that's essential, but you also have departments which are more related to, to the strategy, to the operations, and they need to have a clear understanding of uh, why they would need to do or follow your price movements. The thing is that, um, as you notice, it has some complexity to, to develop such a system. So the question would be how, how this can be developed and how you can provide such explanations to, to the, those decision makers or pricing experts that they can, in a way that they can use it uh, within the current processes. And this is exactly what we have been trying to develop, which is this, uh, a framework for explaining behind the name pricing. Um, in this framework, we actually have uh, different steps. Some of these steps are more related to data science process themselves. So, you know, um, preparing data, cleaning data, uh, understanding what, what are the business goals, uh, treating this data, testing different models around this data. So all steps which are very familiar to data scientists and, 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 and machine learning engineers. engineers. Uh, and also, of course, one of the important uh, aspects is the, the output or what are the dimensions uh, which you need to consider in order to better, uh, to better settle the prices. So as I mentioned before, when you, when you are pricing such a scenario in such a global regional uh, uh, reality scenario, you need to account for different aspects, 
So of course, some of the data points that you might be, that you can look into is your sales history, your previous invoices, production costs, but you also need to look into what's happening around you or around around the globe, like uh, uh, big events like the World Cup, uh, which is happening now, um, potential crisis regarding pandemics, GDPs of different countries. So again, this complexity of that you, of uh, the need that you, that you have to deal with different realities, and and also the the what you can get out of this, right? Which is actually the main point of this presentation, the set of explanations, because what you get out of of such a system can be used, will we be used by a decision maker? So, uh, what kind of questions they can answer with such uh, outcomes? For example, what would happen if um, I change the order or I change the product in this particular order. What happens if the demand in a particular market would increase? Um, what I can do to be more competitive? So you have different types of questions which can be answered uh, with such ex explanations. And what I wanted to do today is exactly to focus on more on this aspect than on the technical and data part, uh, which is exactly on how we have been trying to align user requirements to such explanations or the outputs of these systems. Uh, one of the things um, we've managed to analyze so far is a set of requirements and also in classifying these requirements. So the way um, I would like to, to, to provide it to you is in these three categories, because uh, out of the many requirements we have managed to get, um, I would say these are, um, like covering most of the, the uh, terminology and meaning. So basically you have technical explainability and evaluation requirements. In summary, what they, 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 they show is that the users of such systems, they would need some understanding. They, it's not about developing the system, training a model and providing it to a user with some visualization. You need to, to, make, you need to make sure that your user has some understanding of data has some understanding of AI, it doesn't need to be the math, maths behind the, the models, but what it can do, what it can provide, and also what kind of explanations they need. And of course, how they would measure or how they see performance from these models. And, and in the end, what you need to do, or what we, we've been trying to do, is to align such requirements to uh, particular capabilities of explainable AI or explanations. And one of the approaches I, I, I have been trying to do is to design a process which um, walks through different explanations, different visualizations, following the tasks of um, these decision makers. Uh, and out of, of such a process, uh, you can have some particular principles. So basically, whenever we are providing uh, an explainable AI system, whether in dynamic pricing or in different use cases, what you need to make sure, you need to make sure that you, you, you can conceptualize AI and explain AI to stakeholders. You need to understand if the explanations will actually be a, a good fit to their current processes, how they are currently doing decision-making, how many people they have, how many alignments they have. So all those aspects getting together will, will show you what kind of explanations, what kind of visualizations, they should see in particular steps of their decision-making process. And I think it, it, it's better to understand visually and, and, and present visually these principles or some examples. So that's why I move on to particular visualizations just to give you an idea of how these explanations could look like. So here you have, for example, for a particular product that uh, the, our company is selling, some explanations in terms of why this price was given between uh, 1324 1379 euro per ton it's because of a particular raw material which has a cost increasing it's because of the energy it's because of the the products in stock so the decision maker can see if he agrees or not with the model based on his previous knowledge that's why such ex an explanation is important as well as giving him an idea of what happens if the price or if the, the cost of gas, if the cost of a particular internal cost driver that you have changes? 
for a higher and lower threshold. And then they can see different prices given uh, for this particular product to rely on it or not. Uh, then rule-based explanations can be, can be also given out of a system, which can actually be already used uh, in reports, um, you know, and also for communication between different stakeholders. So again, to really, the goal is that explanations should help decision-making, but also internal processes, communication between different stakeholders and different departments. Um, what I wanted to finalize with my presentation is to, to also have a, um, make another connection to, to retail because pricing in retailing itself is of course essential. I don't, I don't even need it to mention that, but such as, as we have seen airlines, the Amazon web shopping, also fashion shopping. Uh, however, before what I wanted to, to give us takeaway is that before thinking of or implementing such systems like dynamic pricing, we need to understand that customer behavior will keep change. We can be dynamic and precise, but we also need to be accountable. And well, we also need to be explainable because it's not one number, it's a number with many factors behind it. Um, decision makers also need to be empowered by such systems. Again, it's not only giving the price, you need to see the aftermath of this price, either for, also for the customer, but also for the decision maker. And to, to get such systems into different environments, you need to consider, first of all, who is gonna use it and what are the processes in which this system can blend in. And finally, uh, interdisciplinarity is key. So in the end, when you have such systems, you, you will never be alone playing or improving those systems. You need to talk to management, you need to, to explain it, you need to see how you can improve it. So. That's the, the summary of what we have been trying to do and some takeaways. And with this, I wanted to finalize and also give some acknowledgements because uh, this process which, which I've been working on is also part of my PhD, which uh, I have been co-supervised by Professor Marcus Helfert from Minuf University. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Douglas, you, sh you, share you saved yourself from the bell when you said the word finally on the penultimate sentence. So, <laughs> well done. Um, thank you so yeah. much for that. I mean, I think certainly for a lot of people listening in today, um, we're all so aware of dynamic pricing with very volatile supply chains and uncertainty in supply chains uh, globally that actually dynamic pricing and uh, the use of AI applied to that is really critically important. And nice to see AI in this context of retail, not just being used for marketing and that, well, it is one of the principles of marketing is pricing, but in that consumer facing part to include pricing in that. So thank you so much. And without further ado, Rehan, we're, we're back to you for the update on everything that's going on within the retail cluster. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you. I'll, I think I'm sharing my screen. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, thanks John and thanks all the speakers. Uh, really very interesting uh, presentation and a lot of things which we can take uh, for, from the different technologies we, we are using in, into retail. I just quickly want to kind of give updates of the projects we are doing in retail uh, at IBI. So first of all, I just want to introduce what the IBI Digital Retail Cluster is about. So we want to empower our uh, retail ecosystem members who are members of uh, the RBI retail cluster in terms of helping them in the digital transformation. And we are the leading digital research, research group in Ireland. We have uh, we are currently just about to finish a 4 million EU project on digital retail. And our main focus is making sure that technology and sustainable business models in retail keep on working. So I would introduce three projects which we have recently completed or still ongoing. So the first project is Redirect project, which we have done in partnership with Kilkenny Group and MTU. And that was based on this idea of building an interactive platform, which allows you to investigate uh, design experience uh, in based on customer behavior data. So there were three main parts to it. So one was kind of combining all the different data sources which uh, Kilkenny had at producing analytics the 
combined. The second was to make sure that we are, we are using the new technologies such as uh, virtual reality. Uh, we, we built a virtual reality store with Kilkenny and that basically pointed us with another way of getting customer data and improving customer experience. And all of this basically then comes to down to a dashboard which Kilkenny is now using to make all the decisions which are data supported and customer driven. And just a quote from the CEO of Kilkenny in terms of uh, acknowledging the work we have done with them. Uh, so secondly, we we have done a small, we are currently about to finish a small project with uh, Basecamp, another retailer in, in Ireland, and that is based on conceptualization and development of omnichannel inventory update application. So basically the issue in, in this case was the the in-store pricing and website pricing were not uh, similar and it was very difficult for them to update their, their pricing online and offline at the same time uh, because they keep getting new new orders and some of them would would be then updated in in-store and not online and so basically then uh, RBI and base can work together to build this application which makes sure that all the prices are aligned and customers see the same prices online and offline. And the third project uh, which we are currently doing, uh, focusing a lot on is the ethical data generation and exploitation framework for retail. So this has uh, come around with the working with the different retailers. Uh, so we have, we have been a part of a working group with retailers that this came out as a code co-creation, co-development with, with, with practitioners. And basically it has five main areas, data strategy, data generation, exploitation, technology and exchange. And to allow retailers to process the data, to get most value out of the data, but also keep the trust of the customer. So that is very important. So this framework kind of combines these two things and gives retailers this chance to utilize the data while being ethical. And just a couple of uh, future projects area which we are thinking of working in. One is kind of value of data in terms of assigning a monetary value to data. That's, that would be very interesting in terms of uh, how retailers value data, which, which they have, for example, how much worth is a address of a customer to them. Secondly, shared data spaces, and that's something when we are working with different retailers that has come out a lot, that smaller retailers especially have very limited amount of data. So if they can combine the data pool with other retailers and also supply chain providers, lo suppliers, logistic providers, and so on, so they could be a very good data, shared data space that can be utilized by all the ecosystem members. And the last thing, uh, coming forward from the virtual reality project, which we have done, we're looking more into how we can uh, utilize analytics in, in, in Metaverse. So these are the main things uh, and just coming to the emerging trends in, in retail at the moment. So at IBI, we are looking into all of them uh, and trying to help retailers in, in these areas. So just uh, uh, call out that if you want to work in any one of these areas, we we are happy to help you and uh, we're happy to do projects with them. There are multiple fundings available. As I mentioned, the first couple of projects, uh, the redirect project with Kilkenny was funded by Enterprise Island Innovation Partnership. The second project with Basecamp was funded by uh, Innovation Voucher Program. So there are a lot of funding available and if you want to work with us, get in touch and uh, we are, we would be happy to do some projects with different retailers on new technologies and how they can improve. So yeah, that's it, a bit of advertisement. Uh, back to John. Thank you so much, Rehan, for that. I mean, I have to compliment you guys, less of an advertisement and just more of a really solid guide for the really great work that you guys are doing. There's been some great content there. I've got a ton of questions you'll be delighted to know. They're all my own because none of our guests have sent any in yet. But um, so I'm going to start at the top of the page. And I'm going to start with Paul and then I have questions for Eleanor and Douglas and Rehan. But uh, Paul, I'm going to start with you. Um, 
this is really interesting technology, right? And I get that most of us experience some chatbot pop up in the corner of our screens. Where, to what extent do you think this is, this kind of technology is broadly being accepted by SME retailers, or is it still very much the domain of um, service providers, utility providers in that customer experience perspective? And the second question I have for you, which is kind of a follow on from that is, if you could wave a magic wand, if you could shake one part of retail or service provision by the shoulders and say, get on this, you are missing a trick, who would it be? There are my two questions for you. Okay. Um... So um, what I normally just say to people about this is um, people, like if I'm trying to do the evangelical, look, everyone look over here stuff, it's uh, it's um, the unreal humans, the really, I mean, it's astonishing when you see these kind of generated people there, and it's an incredible thing. But we're not going to see that in retail for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'll turn up in games and movies and entertainment a long time before it turns up in retail. But they're still basically artificial humans. Um, and I think that the recent um, Amazon cutbacks in the Alexa department mean that you're going to see fewer Alexa-driven devices um, given up by the likes of Amazon. And I think the same will happen from, from Google. But the thing that everybody misses is on every website, there's a little circle in the bottom and people think of it as a web chat. And if you think of your experience, I mean, you don't have to be genius to, to do this. Just click on any one of them and ask them a question and it'll go, thank you for your inquiry. Someone will get back to you. And that's it. You might as well just go put your email here and move on. Um, yeah. So everyone's like got the space. Like there's a, there's a space on everyone's site for intelligent conversations but no one's really put any effort into it. So in terms of people maybe using this technology, there are now like a few really decent solutions in the Shopify world where you can just click, click, click and start adding some of your, your um, uh, content, like your, your product content, uh, be available for questioning on that. Um, I, I think that's just really simple. Like, do you guys stock this? Could you get it to me by this time? Where do I pay? Like really simple questions, really easy to do. Um, I, th I think the um, the next kind of linkage here is Douglas. I was very interested in, in in his presentation because it really shows that if you were able to build these models to this kind of depth, then assistant at the front of it, you just ask it. Like if I was to order this today, how much would it cost me? Versus if I order this, but I, I pay for it now, but I get it delivered in September what price could you give me? And it gives you maybe a calculated price as to how you do that. So I, I think where retailers are missing out, the, the obvious um, things is, is just engaging with customers so that they can answer simple questions and then pass it over to an agent or a person. Like you, you could be like every carpenter, plumber person, they're retailing their own services to people. Right? And yet they have no way of, having a personal assistant that says, look, Paul can't be out to you tomorrow at three, but if four worked for you, I can come and fix your boiler, right? That means you have one extra booking in your day, probably doubled your profitability in the day. Um, so I, I think that there's a huge potential here for, for, for every business, but just simple connecting of questions at the front end to your agents at the back end, just make that really easy. And yeah. believe me, you'll, you'll, you'll save a ton. It makes a lot of sense. And I think particularly that bit about um, if I buy it now or if I do it later. And, and I think um, an opportunity in that context is a recent experience with Sorry, a bank. I lost the connection there, if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. I was just saying a recent experience I had was um, with a bank. And, um, and actually, you're right, that dynamic future pricing or that sense of it. And I think... It was more it was around mortgages or interest rates or something on what might they be or whatever but um i think about that from uh, switcher businesses you know people like bonkers.ie and stuff like that being able to offer some of that um because at the moment they'll either they'll either tell you dynamically but just visually on a screen or you phone them but it's the idea of being able to scale 
um, those kind of switcher businesses by using those almost like avatar personalities would be really useful. So uh, that was really cool. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come to, I'm going to come to Eleonora next because my question for you really, I loved what you were talking about visual data, particularly in the context of um, property. And I mean, multi-use shopping centers where there's more than one, um, more than one retailer, because I think, you know, to a certain extent we're, we're quite comfortable with the idea of, of visual data in that context of within individual stores, but not within the context of retail portfolios. And also knowing what, in that context, in flow from that, um, what we think customers are interested in and what they're actually interested in. So this idea, if we can, um, the example that you gave of looking at a, they never take a photograph of the view, they take a photograph of the room. So understanding their motivations, what are they trying to say about themselves uh, versus the photograph of the view, which you could arguably take even if you're not in the room. Does that make sense? But um, from a reach from a multi-campus um, real estate perspective, uh, large shopping centers, understanding expressions on people's faces and being able them, then to direct them to what it is would appease that look of either frustration or hunger, or is it hangry? Um, so tell me um, from your from your perspective, looking at all that, again, same question I had to Paul really is, where would you like to see it used more? Um, and who do you think is using it most effectively? Okay, so uh, first, uh, we also conducted some research concerning uh, consumers' willingness uh, to let retailers use this kind of data. And uh, um, we just published uh, this study. Of course, today I couldn't uh, present all because I was already over time. But uh, uh, consumers uh, would share these, uh, would uh, even let uh, uh, retailers to collect the data directly from uh, CCTV. So real time and uh, without really posing. Uh, but the point is that consumers want to have something uh, in exchange. So they, uh, of course, we all allow for security purposes uh, to collect uh, uh, our faces when we are in the airport, faces, videos, <laughs> etc., because uh, uh, it is uh, for um, safety. It is clear and uh, it is fine with, uh, with us. However, in the stores, uh, consumers should be uh, informed how this data will be used and what they will have in change. Uh, for instance, we noticed that uh, um, some older generations would cover their uh, natural re reluctance uh, to uh, use this technology if they can get something like a better welcome service. Yeah. Because we noticed that uh, this is the place where they want to have uh, a customized service. So in this case, they will uh, let retailers use it. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, do I walk into a shopping center with a sign over it saying, you are entering a monitored recorded zone and you opt in or opt out at that door, how many people would not go in there versus people would just take the chance going, oh, do you know what? They're going to record it anyway. You know, it's like, do we have, is there an obligation for, for when you walk into a large shopping center like that, a large, almost campus type one to say, your face will be recorded, your data will be used to provide a shopping experience. If you do not want your face, how can, you know what I mean? It's, it's gonna be hard to manage. Yeah, but uh, uh, retailers should be more precise on how yeah. it will be used. Because uh, when I told you, when we go to the border control in the airport, we are recorded, uh, not only yes. the face, also the gesture, the video, and uh, we are fine because we know that it is for security, for identifying people, and in that case, they don't uh, only take points on the face, uh, they take all uh, information that in this case is not uh, necessary. But uh, in this case, we want to know, it's not only for a generic uh, improvement of the shopping experience, even if because uh, um, I told you, in, I had already anticipated in these uh, recent studies, we noticed that uh, there are two kinds of benefits that uh, um, consumers want, utilitarian or 
economic benefits. So do you want to have information about my behavior or my face? Uh, but uh, in change, you have to give me something. And uh, you have to explain me exactly how you use this information. Yeah, but that's, that's customers really stepping up to leverage the value of their own data in a way that they haven't been able to do in social media up until now, where they seeded all their data from the very get-go. Um, it was allowed to be used and they just stopped objecting and then it became too late. And I don't know whether or not this is a, a turn on that for, for consumers to really stand back and say, you know what? I gave it to the, I gave it to Meta, I gave it to Twitter, I gave it to Google, whoever for too long, I'm not giving away my face anymore. So it'll be interesting to see how consumers sign up to or resist on that. Um, my, my next question, I'm conscious of time as well, is to, I want to move on to Douglas. I, I really loved the data I say that you're using it there for, um, for dynamic pricing, but also I got a very sense of, it's almost like a digital twin of a marketplace. Is that a correct analogy? Yes or no? And, and if it is beyond its, its immediate use for dynamic pricing from a consumer point of view and understanding it, how can it be used better for business modeling? And my other part is then how difficult, easy is it for a business to build up those models themselves? Thanks, uh, John, for the question. Yeah, um, regarding this uh, digital twin perspective, I would say uh, you can see it like this because indeed uh, the company has, um, you know, like a, for example, web commerce, but that's for specific customers. So um, you have different approaches for ordering refractories. So one is you just give a call or you have a sales manager that you know very well for long and you have already this connection or you can go to this uh, service online and you can do it by yourself. Um, you, you, we, are, we also have some approaches, features that like I think Amazon has some kind of subscription as well that you, you know, from in, in every few months you get your order because we, we know, we understand that your behavior is like this. Um, but uh, uh, of course I was talking more from this uh, global larger company perspective for, for, for the name pricing. But uh, your second question is interesting because uh, then it, it makes me think how this can be related to smaller business or even startups, how they can manage that right, for, for their products and, and services. Uh, the thing is, I, I would say uh, that the challenge we face now with implementing these dynamic pricing strategies is really related to the size and to the different departments, understanding knowledge in terms of what should be really the price or how you should communicate this price. So maybe when you see this in, in smaller companies, you have less uh, barriers. But again, this might not be the case for all. What I, what I would say is that independently of the size of the company, you really need to, to consider how people are currently doing their pricing, for example, uh, what are the processes there, what kind of tools they are using in which you can better blend such technologies. Because in the end, it's not about, you know, calling a, a third party provider for such a system, you start to use it. This, this won't work, definitely not. You need to really understand the environment, the users over there. Yeah. So you're recommending that people get under the hood of their own data and build out this themselves rather than try to buy some white labeled pricing algorithm that's going to, that's based on a, a more generic model. Yes. I mean, sometimes those companies, they also have this approach that they, um, first of all, get into your business, try to understand it, uh, understand your processes, how it's work. So even if um, you go for such a solution, a ready to use solution, I think you need to, to uh, make sure that they also have such principles, you know, because again, um, it doesn't matter talking about AI like magic. We know it's not magic. We need to understand how it's going to be used what it can provide, what, it, what are its uh, weaknesses. And I, I really think, and I can totally relate to the, the previous presentations from, from Leonora and Paul, because they were also talking about this explainability aspect. 
which uh, we all see as uh, very important nowadays, mainly also uh, I think you know that uh, the European Union also has its own principles for explainable and trustworthy AI. So this is a topic which you definitely stay. And, um, you know, even if, okay, we need to be fast with pricing, with dynamic pricing, but it's not something that you can just grant the machine to do. You need to understand why maybe some prices are going up or down, which customers are getting affected. So those are important questions as well. Yeah, and not only which customers are being affected, but how the price elasticity changes from mm -hmm. one customer group to another where there's greater tolerances. Um, Rehan, I was really interested in that last slide you put up. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I actually took a photograph of the screen. I still forgot some of them because all I got stuck on the word, oh, this is retail apocalypse. So actually, I did, a, I did a presentation the other day on emerging technology trends for the Law Society. And one of the things I looked at was retail. And um, we were looking at dynamic supply chains, micro factories and all that. But one of the things that caught my eye the most, which actually would be interesting from Paul's perspective too, I think, was this direct to avatar <laughs> trend. Direct to avatar and how a Gen Zers surveyed said that they are more themselves online. Their avatar version of themselves is more real and authentic to their personality than their real version of themselves, which I was amused by on the grounds that um, authentically, I may wish to feel like I can afford to buy Balenciaga, which I can now do on Roblox um, or 4,000 <laughs> you know, euros on a, so, a, something Gucci, yeah. I can't remember, on Fortnite or yeah. maybe it's yeah. the other way around. But I'm going, well, I don't know whether that's a more authentic version of myself or a more aspirationally authentic version of a Gen Zer, but I did think it was rather amusing in terms of retail apocalypse and the idea that retailers are building virtual products to sell to virtual people and and is that part of your retail apocalypse horizon or is it in fact just many more customers who aren't even real and actually those customers we now have to tend to too so we can take we can we can use images or sentiment analysis for the physical person and they may have multiple personalities on, on multiple avatars and now I get four customers for the price of one but they still only have limited income and and which which one of their versions of themselves is spending the more the most and then we're going to have interoperability of avatars as well and then at that point my mind is kind of blown and I'm going oh my god retail is so cool discuss <laughs> yeah five yeah. minutes or less <laughs> I'll, I'll start first with, I think like, we have to go back to the definition of retail. And like, I think that is kind of like the retail as we understand it, uh, understood it like 10 years ago is fundamentally changing. And I think as, as you just mentioned, it would, it would change more going forward. And the things about metaverse, like the, as soon as metaverse is, something in which we are living, especially Generation Z and coming upcoming generations, if you are living half of your life there or 75% of your life there, that's where you want to shop, right? So the, you, you want a good look where, where you spend your most time in. So you, you want to spend your most time online in a virtual world, in, in your, wearing your VR glasses and all, doing all the personal activities there. So that's where you want to project your best best self. Now, I suppose, what's the point in buying a pair of physical trainers it, in a it, really it, expensive, exclusive brand if I never leave the house and no one will ever see them, whereas I'm better off buying a virtual brand, virtual version of really expensive trainers where I hang out online all the time and I can show them off to everybody. I've just realized how that makes so much sense mm -hmm. in a very disturbed way. Yeah, yeah like, the, of course, that that is disturbing at so many levels, especially... <laughs> Well, we're meant to be all very cool on this call and very protect, so we're not meant to be disturbed by any of this. We're meant to be excited. Just yeah. disturbed is my under yeah. my overriding feeling right now. Um, yeah, but uh, Paul, Paul, yeah, so Paul, you, I think you jump in on this, Paul. What's your perspective from that avatar version of myself? Um, so uh, I, I think that's well and truly like done as documented, and it, it's going to yeah. happen. And like it isn't up for kind of if no. this is a cool new trend. So um, the amount of time that people spend in 
games, social media, social media environments, other environments, uh, you know, has just gone up and up and up. But I think that the, um, um, like the, uh, what I just made a note here about the um, uh, social, like cultural products, like how much of a product is cultural product and cultural, like your Gucci bag. Okay, some of it is good leather, but the rest of it is like an idea of design and cultural yeah. magic, right? So um, cultural products are nothing new and they take up an even larger amount of the value of a physical product is the cultural values, the structure of that. So how do you generate cultural value? What What is it? And the idea of access and of identity um, are kind of two levers to that. So if you can be given access to something because of who you are, what you've done or an attainment that you have, then that is a, a privilege and a thing. And then you can get a, a badge or a gesture to say that that is, you've attained that in some way. Again, it's a gaming kind of gaming mechanism from the past, but even doing something like being, I'm a Patreon uh, uh, funder of a podcast and you turn up somewhere and you're wearing the, I'm the Patreon sponsor of this podcast you're one of the three percent of the, the people who really care and therefore you're gesturing again that you care enough to pay and therefore the cultural value is in the mm -hmm. in the ability to demonstrate that, that you've done that so again it's it's largely cultural and then it kind of reminds me of being in this kind of metaverse um world is a bit like when they first had the the movie camera the first thing they could think about making a movie of was a play because that's what was there and that's what you kind of understood there wasn't a language of video yet there wasn't a language of movies which evolved over time and now we're trying to think of well how does cultural value accrue in a in this kind of future environment and we think about it in the physical terms and ways that we are but there will be an evolving um like a different evolving social cultural system that will come out of that so it's, it's going to be very hard to judge i think as to how value will, will will accrue in that kind of environment? I, I'm I've got two kids who do the Roblox thing and and buy things and stick it on their characters and all the rest. They're totally happy with those purchases. They don't regret it. They there's no like I was tricked into buying it. Yeah, that's they're very happy with their purchase. Yeah, it's um it's a very it's a very interesting space. And as you say, I mean, I think the genie is out of the bottle. I think, you know, the horse has bolted. It is, it is happening. It is a very real thing. And and even if, when you sorry, said... If, sorry, if I could say something about cultural apart or not cultural apart, but retail apocalypse. When you said retail apocalypse to me, it meant uh, that something like, is it 80% of all new online purchases go to Amazon? I think that may be what Rehan was coming at in, in that sense. I mean, and we're going to see Black Friday tomorrow and it'll be more of that. Um, and I, But I think part of, a part of a retail apocalypse has to be when we look at sustainability and we say, why are we buying so much stuff? And part of our sustainability mission for retail and the big challenge will be is how do we buy less without it being a retail apocalypse? I mean, we don't want it. We don't want to... Um, destroy businesses and livelihoods, but we do need to find a better way of consuming that is not consuming so much stuff all of the time. <laughs> now that does, now I'm, I'm not gonna let you answer that now, Rahim, because I am promised I would get everyone off on time, but that does lead me on to the spring schedule because I did not do that by accident. That was a very purposeful <laughs> segue by me because if um, Carol wants to pop up the final slide, for this afternoon session, you will notice that the IVI, the IVI webinar series continues, obviously, into 2023. I realize we've been doing this online, Carol, since since the start of lockdown, since so since I think March 2020. Um, so we're heading into our next year of that. And speaking of 2023, on the 23rd of March, we have one on the circular economy. That was my lovely segue. And on my birthday, the 25th of May, I will be, someone will be hosting a session on digital construction. So um, maybe I won't be doing that on my birthday, but I'm very happy to talk circularity with anyone on the 23rd of March. And um, so yes, so exciting new webinars coming up in the series in the spring. And as you all know, there are 
there are um, research leads on all of these areas within the IVI. So I strongly recommend that you contact info at IVI.ie to find out who the Rehan is for your, for your sector, for your vertical, or your area of interest. Um, they have some amazing insights to share. Always happy, I know, to collaborate with industry on the various projects, research that they're working on and all of the funding that is available through that. So do check in with the guys at info at IVI.ie. Follow them on, we're still following people on Twitter. I've lost a hundred followers in the last week. I think it's because they all left. Um, and then on linkedin.com and IVI.ie. And as I say, there are dates for your diaries. Um, if you want to just put a placeholder in your diary for them for now. Um, I want to thank you all, Rehan, uh, Douglas, Eleonora, Paul, Carol at IVI and all the gang there for inviting me to come along this afternoon. And um, I will be catching up with the IVI at 9.30 tomorrow morning again to talk with, uh, to, to attend the Empower session in Dublin. So, um, so much great stuff happening in Maynooth. So thank you all very much. And uh, hey, that's it. We're all done. Class Take care, folks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.